Thank you for joining us this evening. You are now attending the webinar entitled, What the Fact? Finding the Truth in All the Noise. Our leader for this session is Dr. Seema Yasmin, Clinical Assistant Professor, Department of Medicine, Stanford University. I also want to acknowledge the presence of uh, one of our members of our Teacher Advisory Council who does an awesome job, and he's a former institute participant as well, uh, but Shanga Bay is here. Shanga teaches at the Mary Institute in St. Louis Country Day School in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, Shanga, thank you for joining us, and uh, thanks for all that you do um, for the Teacher Advisory Council. We are uh, truly honored to have you uh, as a part of our team. Sima Yasmin is an Emmy Award-winning journalist, medical doctor, professor, and author of five books and three forthcoming books. She is uh, director of the Stanford Health Communication Initiative, clinical assistant professor in Stanford University's Department of Medicine, and visiting professor at the Anderson School of Management at UCLA, where she teaches crisis management and communications. She's a popular keynote speaker and has been invited to speak at the Vatican, White House, Aspen Ideas Festival, and Skoll World Forum. Yasmin was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in Breaking News in 2017 with a team from the Dallas Morning News for coverage of a mass shooting. She is the recipient of two awards from the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting. Her reporting appears in Rolling Stone, The New York Times, Wired, Scientific American, and other outlets. She's a medical analyst for CNN and a correspondent for the Condé Nast Entertainment. Yasmin is a fiction fellow of the Kundeman and Ten House Writing Workshops. Her poems and short stories have been published in literary magazines and anthologies, including The Breakbeat Poets, Volume 3, Halal If You Hear Me, New Moon's Contemporary Writing by North American Muslims, The Georgia Review, The Literary Review, Foundry, The Los Angeles Review, The Asian American Writers Workshop, Apagi, and others. Her writing has earned awards and residencies from the Malay Colony for the Arts, Mid-Atlantic Arts Council, Hedgebrook, and others. Her scholarly work focuses on the spread of health misinformation and disinformation, the growth of medical and news deserts, and the impact on public health. She teaches creative nonfiction, including health and science journalism, global health storytelling, practicing medicine with empathy and compassion, and advanced clinical communication skills. Her unique combination of expertise in epidemics, science, communication, and journalism has been called upon by the Presidential Commission for the Study of Bioethical Issues, the Aspen Ideas Festival, and the Skull World Forum. To our network of teachers, both nationally and internationally, and without further ado, I present to you our scholar and our leader for this session, Dr. Seema Yasmin. Uh, we are honored to have you with us tonight, and we truly look forward to your talk. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mike, for that very kind introduction, and thank you for everyone at NHC for the invitation and for making today's session happen. As you know, my talk is called What the Fact? Finding the Truth in All the Noise, and although this is a very contemporary topic, we're going to start here in the 1600s with the story of a lamb. In 1683, King Charles XI of Sweden ordered the German doctor and explorer Engelbert Kampfer to investigate if lambs grew on trees. So here is Engelbert. He, as you can see, look, is very respectable and appears very erudite. He's the author of many books based on his explorations throughout different parts of the world. And so he, of course, says yes to King Charles XI of Sweden. And in 1683, Engelbert embarks on an expedition. Because at that time, he was not alone, and the king was not alone, in believing that woolly 200-pound lambs grew on trees in India and in parts of Asia, which were known to Europeans as Tartary. Many of the greatest minds of that time believed that this is how lambs grew. And in fact, these vegetable lambs of Tartary were said to be absolutely delicious. 
Their blood tasted as sweet as honey. Their wool was cottony soft and white as snow. And also they couldn't go very far because they were tethered to a thick stalk that sprouted out of the earth and attached to their bellies. But the greatest minds in the world in 1683 said, yes, these are life-sized, very real lambs, and their meat actually tastes more like cod. There were scientists that said this, there were knights, there were priests, and they weren't alone and neither were they new because for more than a thousand years, respected scholars, explorers, and clergymen had written in books, religious texts, and lectures that vegetable lambs grew on trees in Tartary. They said they had seen them, they had drawn scientific pictures of them, even tasted their blood and their flesh. And so this picture that you're looking at was actually drawn by an English scientist who went by the name of Henry Lee. And what he said was that the first mention of vegetable lambs was in a Jewish text from 436 AD. And so this was a widespread belief. And in 1683, Engelbert is ready with his orders from the King of Sweden. He travels the world. He arrives in Tartary to investigate these trees with the lambs that taste of fish. And he returns empty handed. Lambs do not grow on trees, he tells the king. And that was that. There was a 1,220 year old belief that was debunked. And I share this story because I think we get very bogged down and frustrated now in the, the things that spread. And I want us to always remember that there have been these kinds of salacious and bizarre stories spread for centuries and by academics and clergymen and the most respected scholars in the world. But in case you are thinking, well, lambs growing on trees just sounds entirely bizarre. This happened way back when, and maybe something that is that bizarre wouldn't persist nowadays. Perhaps just we wouldn't believe it. I want to share with you some more recent conspiracy theories. And I was just thinking about this one because it happened in 2020 during the COVID pandemic, when in the summer of that year, as the world is reckoning with the emergence of this novel pathogen, eight engineers are kidnapped and held hostage in the mountains of Peru when all they are trying to do is fix a radio tower, the kind of tower that's used to relay signals that keep the internet and our cell phones working. And the reason that they were captured and held hostage was because of this growing belief that 5G cell phone signals were actually responsible for the global transmission of COVID-19, and that it was these 5G signals that were causing a global pandemic. So in fear of their lives, these engineers who are held hostage are pleading with their kidnappers, and they're saying, look, 5G stands for fifth generation wireless technology. It's going to make your phone calls clearer, your downloads faster and more reliable. It's going to make your life better. And it's definitely not capable of spreading any kind of infection. But even these conspiracy theories are not new and continue to spread. Over the last few years, we've seen a record number of arson attacks against cell towers, again, outside, out of these beliefs, these conspiratorial beliefs that the 5G signals and cell phone towers in general are spreading a virus, maybe coronavirus or other illnesses too. But again, not new because back in 1903, 24 years after the invention of electricity, doctors had already coined a new phrase and it was radiophobia. And it was the fear that all kinds of radiation could damage the body. Now we of course know now that radiation exists on a spectrum and yes, some types of radiation can hurt the body, including ultraviolet rays, which can cause cancer, and x-rays, which are totally fine if you're going to get a chest x-ray, say, that can be damaging in larger amounts. But that type of radiation, the harmful kind, is on one end of the electromagnetic spectrum. It's known as ionizing radiation, which means the radiation holds enough energy to break down your DNA and damage your cells. Of course, 5G radiation, along with microwaves and cell phone radiation, sits on the other end of the spectrum. And these are non-ionizing types of radiation that don't harm our bodies. But of course, this information was out there already. Um, and these conspiracy theories were being debunked, and yet it didn't stop the rumors from spreading. We saw the 
capture of engineers in Peru. We saw mass arson against cell phone towers in Britain and other parts of Europe. And this was during the pandemic when cell phone towers and communication were, you know, especially important. So back and forth across the ages, we've seen this happen. We've seen ideas about electricity or about cell phones or about the vegetable lamb of Tartary spread and sometimes even be spread by credible sources or seemingly legitimate and credible sources. And none of this is new from the vegetable lambs of Tartary to today. And in fact, we know that these are old problems because we have such old language that describes them. So in 1620, the English philosopher Francis Bacon wrote that humans are prone to, and I quote, seize eagerly on any fact, however slender, that supports a theory, but will question or conveniently ignore the far stronger facts that overthrow it. And Bacon, of course, was pointing out words that can be used to obfuscate the truth. He said the ill and unfit choice of words wonderfully obstructs the understanding. He published this in a book, and then 24 years later, Sir Thomas Brown, who was actually a, a physician from, from England, published a book titled Pseudodoxia Epidemica. And actually that translates from the Latin into English to mean an epidemic of fake news. And Dr. Thomas Brown was warning of charlatans. He was using the term quack salvers and sell, sell him bancos, a word that meant a charlatan who sold fake medicines, usually by jumping on a bench to hawk his snake oil. We also have these other words that I've taken from old sources. So in 1796, Gross's Classical Dictionary of the Vulgar Tongue defined a tara tiddle as a fib or falsity, and that one who tells a tara tiddle is a tara tiddler. You'll see also ultra crepidarian was introduced even before that in 1620 to mean someone who opines beyond their expertise. So it's potentially uh, a very old word from, 16, from the 1600s that could be quite useful nowadays. And even earlier in the 1500s, we had this term gudgeon, which was used to refer to a gullible fool who fell for falsehoods. And there's another word too, mumpsimus, which refers to a person who obstinately adheres to old ways in spite of clear evidence that they are actually wrong. The key here, and why I wrote this book, What the Fact, Finding the Truth and All the Noise, which came out a couple of years ago and is for young adult readers, is to prevent any of us from becoming a mumpsimus. And in case you were wondering what led me in particular to write this book, especially because in the introduction that Mike gave, you would have heard that I'm a physician by training and a journalist. Well, I'll give you a brief backstory as to how I came to worry about the spread of misinformation and disinformation, perhaps more than any particular pathogen itself. So I used to work in a hospital in East London, which is where I'm from. I left there from working as a hospitalist and came to the U.S. just over a decade ago to serve as an officer in the Epidemic Intelligence Service, which if you've seen the movie Contagion, you will have seen that Kate Winslet plays the role that I used to have in real life, being a disease detective for the CDC. And when you take on that job, you kind of think that the day-to-day -day crux of your work will be chasing pathogens, perhaps novel or exotic pathogens that are causing outbreaks and doing all that you can to prevent harm from quite rare diseases. So I came to the U.S., this was my dream job at the time in 2011, and this is what I was dealing with day in, day out. Not just measles, but a massive rise in diseases that used to be prevented by vaccines. Whooping cough, mumps, rubella, children dying from influenza, children dying from whooping cough in the United States. There were outbreaks in megachurches in Texas and yoga studios in Arizona and charter schools everywhere. You might remember the Disneyland measles outbreak around that about 10 years ago, too. And it occurred to me that 
the CDC and the federal government and the military were training us to deal with a pathogen as if that was the enemy. So we had the tool book for that. We had the toolkit for that. We would arrive in a hot zone where an infection was spreading and we knew what to do to stamp out a particular pathogen. Except I realized we didn't really because we were dealing as if, or we were acting as if the pathogen was spreading in isolation. And actually what was happening in every single outbreak was that the pathogen was spreading alongside misinformation and disinformation about the disease or about a vaccine or a treatment or scientists or government or science in general. And we were so poorly equipped to deal with that contagion of information. And yet that contagion of information had all of the power and the possibility of unraveling our advancements in public health. So what good is an MMR vaccine if children in America can still die from measles because there are people that don't believe the vaccine is safe? So here's the logo for the Epidemic Intelligence Service. That's me in an Ebola laboratory around the time of that outbreak. And here, you know, we might criticize Hollywood for sensationalizing so much. But one thing that the movie does well is it does highlight, I think, the contagion of emotion, the contagion of information or false information, and shows how the transmission of those elements, the transmission of fear and anxiety can be so powerful and can accelerate the spread of a pathogen as well. So we know how this looks in the context of a real life pandemic when I talk about fear and anxiety spreading, when I talk about the very real spread of misinformation and disinformation, because all of us lived through this and this. And again, connecting those dots between what's happening now and what's happened in the past, let me also share with you this. The Anti-Mask League mass meeting ends in Battle Royale. This is a news article about an anti-mask league in San Francisco in 1918, at the time of the Spanish flu pandemic. So again, just to highlight that this isn't brand new, we've seen this. And really, to the latter point of my talk, which is very solutions oriented and very forward looking, because we've seen this, and because we know we have words like ultra crepidarian and salt in banco, we should be so much better prepared for dealing with these problems and for what I'm going to describe later, which is building, quote unquote, mental immunity or cognitive immunity against falling for falsehoods. And what I mean there is teaching people from a young age how to develop a kind of cognitive resilience that protects them from falling for falsehoods and joining an anti-mask league or in 2020 being at a protest with signs like these ones. And then, of course, this happened as if the pandemic wasn't enough. And actually, this is part of the story of what led to me writing What the Fact, because myself and my team and editors in different places were thinking, okay, how do we prevent this from happening again? And of course, I mean, one of the very obvious solutions is to say, can we teach media literacy and digital literacy, please, and critical thinking, thinking skills from a very young age so that this doesn't happen to children when they become adults? So a quick poll for you. I'll see if I can see your, your responses in the audience chat or in the, the actual Q&A, and if not, just shout into your laptop, how many states do you think require media literacy to be taught in schools? I'll give you a second to think about it. Let's see if any responses come up in the chat. Okay, so Rob is saying three. Jessica's saying zero, and I fully understand where these thoughts are coming from. And yeah, great point about what's the definition of media literacy, because I'll, I'll get into that in a second. But your responses and guesses are more on the lower side. 
And so I'll tell you, and this might be a tiny bit surprising, is that actually 18 states require some teaching of media literacy, and that's what the data will tell you, except, of course, there are major caveats. And I think one of, the, one of you just alluded to that in the chat by saying, well, what exactly are we saying media literacy refers to? Does it include critical thinking? Is there some element of digital literacy? How broad is this? And it is so incredibly variable. Everything from a state that on paper, like Texas, that has quite a solid plan for incorporating media literacy into K through 12 curricula. But then in my experience, when I've been touring with what the facts and talking to teachers is that doesn't necessarily mean that they are supported or have the resources to actually translate that into uh, classroom time or into um, lesson plans. You also have Illinois, where I'm sure some of you are based, which very recently, a year or two ago, incorporated media literacy into K through 12, and it's one unit. And that really, in my opinion, came about, even that one unit, its inclusion came about because of very concerted and energetic lobbying on the part of local academics who study media literacy and a nonprofit. And they said that in their endeavors to lobby across the U.S., it can take five to 10 years to get a bill to pass if it will pass at all. Why this is important? Because we have the data that shows that 55% of K through 12 students are not even moderately confident in their ability to recognize false information. It makes me think of our perception as well of what we think we are able to do and not do. So this was a YouGov poll that found that 6% of Americans think they could beat a grizzly bear in a fight, which I'm not really sure is the most accurate representation um, of our physical strength. So then I'm not so trustworthy even of how much we think we perceive we can separate facts from fiction when it hits us in the media. But it is interesting seeing this. 8% think that they could beat a lion. 72% of us think we could beat a rat. I know I would run, so that doesn't apply to me. Um, oh, and then this is just interesting, that <laughs> compared to women, men feel most able to take on medium-sized dogs and geese. Important information to consider here in the context of us asking people to self-report their ability to do something, whether it's to fight a medium-sized dog or a goose or whether it's to, as we do in our studies, present people with a series of headlines and ask them to judge which is credible and factual and which is fictitious, and we don't always do so well. The data also shows that eight to 18 year olds devote seven hours and 38 minutes per day to using media, more than 53 hours a week, and actually what's happening there is there's media multitasking, so using more than one medium at a time. What some Hollywood um, producers and executives are referring to as second screening, which is when they look at a screenplay or a pitch for an idea, they sometimes, I am hearing, will go back to writers and say, oh, your screenplay for this crime show is actually above an audience now and too complicated because people are second screening. So you need to make sure they're not going to miss valuable information while they are scrolling through TikTok or Instagram or any other news feed. The interesting thing here is because of second screening or multi media multitasking, it means that eight to 18 year olds actually pack a total of 10 hours and 45 minutes worth of media content into those seven hours and 38 minutes because of that consumption of multiple streams of information at the same time. We are very, quite literally deluged. And so what about geriatric millennials, which is the age group that I fit into, not the eight to 18 year olds? We are nearing 40 and it turns out that 58% of us did not learn how to analyze science news stories for bias and credibility in high school. 62% of us did not learn how to analyze media messaging and the same proportion of us said that we had no opportunity in high school to reflect on how media messaging impacted their beliefs. Now, I've been here for over a decade in the US. I'm obviously from the UK to begin with, and it, it feels very similar. So these results, you could say, of this lack of 
education around media literacy and digital literacy and critical thinking means, of course, we are swimming in conspiracy theories, misperceptions about the COVID vaccine, about the war in Ukraine, the war in the Middle East. This is so content agnostic. And when it comes to disinformation, which is false information spread with the intention to cause chaos and cause harm, in contrast to misinformation, which is false information that someone shares with you, not realizing it's false in the first place, and they're not trying to hurt you, they're just repeating a thing. But when it comes to disinformation, the bad actors that are seeding the disinformation to cause chaos in the States are content agnostics too. They do deep research on a population and will seek to understand what it is that keeps us up at night, what is already perhaps sowing the seeds of polarization in society, and then they will spread disinformation specifically on those topics, whether it's an upcoming election, whether it's an ongoing conflict, whether it's a new pathogen, whether it's the Black Lives Matter movement or the Women's March. We've seen, in fact, the same disinformation factory in St. Petersburg in Russia spew disinformation about all of these different topics using the same strategies. And so that's why in a moment, I'm going to move on to talking about what strategies are used to dupe us and how there is evidence now that teaching us those strategies builds cognitive immunity and mental resilience in young people too against falling for false information. So then we get to here, which probably not a surprise, again, a result of what we know of the educational system here and in other parts of the world. One in two Americans believes in one or more conspiracy theories. One in four of us that lives here believes that powerful people intentionally planned the COVID-19 pandemic. And I mean, you know, it can get as more and more bizarre. But again, the results are that when there was that awful tragedy in Houston where people died at a concert, the, con the, the, the conspiracy theory that was spreading on Instagram and TikTok was that it wasn't the artist, Travis Scott, that was to blame. It wasn't poor management of the crowd. It was Satan. It was a satanic ritual. And there are people falling for this um, and finding belonging amongst that belief. And of course, here, another result of poor media literacy and digital literacy and critical thinking is these growing book bans across the U.S. And it ends up here in many ways, too, in that folks like myself and other disinformation scholars have been targeted as well, and our lives made difficult, our funding sources challenged because of the, the weaponization and the politicization of our work on disinformation. Very interesting time to be doing this kind of research. So, you know, I, I wonder, like, why isn't media literacy taught to every child? Is it because it's a partisan issue? Is it because it's tricky to legislate? There's an interesting quote from a couple of years back in the New York Times when Rebecca Solnit said, if a government can persuade people to abandon facts and critical thinking, they have a standing army awaiting their next command, which thinking about education made me think of this person, I'm sure you all recognize, Benito Mussolini, who before he was a fascist dictator, was a school teacher and there's been much written about how the seeds of authoritarianism or the seeds of polarization are sown really early and so to many the fact that it's such an uphill struggle to incorporate media literacy and critical thinking into k through 12 feels so much like the opposite of some of the scandinavian countries where it, you know, the education on false information is just being incorporated into curricula and it's being offered in schools, but it's also being offered to people in senior centers and just rolled out society wide so that everyone has a handle on the disinformation playbook, how it is that we're duped, um, how it is that the lies are made to be compelling and engaging and believable and relatable. Um, my take on this is that we do have to be solutions oriented and there's a lot of doom and gloom about quote unquote fake news or misinformation and disinformation and we I think often sit in that space for too long and so I want to shift now to talking about evidence-based solutions 
for debunking, for doing it, that there's an art and a science to doing it effectively, and also evidence-based strategies for, as I mentioned earlier, developing that kind of mental resilience and cognitive protection against falsehoods. And I will say, just before I move on, that with a country like Finland taking on this challenge and saying, look, we're just going to teach this, like the subject it needs, like critical thinking just needs to be taught to everyone. It's interesting that the headline here from CNN says winning the war on fake news, because to me, this approach of rolling out critical thinking and media literacy education for everyone feels like a counter to a national security threat, which is really what this information is. So let's move on to looking at evidence-based strategies. The answer to this question is, of course, Yes. And I want to just take you behind the scenes, because as I've mentioned to you, I started off life as a doctor, then as a disease detective. It was never in my career plan or my life plan to switch gears completely, train as a journalist, and then study communication to understand how it is that falsehoods spread alongside disease. So what I will tell you is I used to study this. It looks really complicated, and I promise you it is not. All this is is a model for predicting how many people will get infected during an outbreak. So if you remember during Ebola 10 years ago, during COVID, when we would have those models of, oh, the infection is here, and we think it's going to spread to this many people by this time, the way we do that is by looking at who's susceptible to who becomes infected, right? So that's all this is. You put numbers in, the algorithm pushes out a number, and it tells you right now 10 people are infected, but because of the things, the numbers you've plugged in about how contagious this is, how densely populated the region is, how much treatment there is, this is how many people stand to get infected. And then what you can build from this is this kind of model, actually, of an outbreak. This is taken from a journal article about a flu outbreak in a high school. So you can see who has flu, who passed it on to who, and also you can use that model I just showed you to say, if this is what it looks like on Tuesday, what will it look like tomorrow based on how many kids are in the school, how contagious flu is, et cetera, et cetera, right? So I knew this going in because I had studied this and worked on this. So just take a eyeball screenshot of this image and now look at this one it looks really similar right it's dots it's connections between the dots so going back this is a visual depiction of an outbreak of flu in a high school this one that looks really similar is a visual depiction of the transmission of a rumor around the world and what blew my mind was that all the time that I had been using this model to say there's an HIV outbreak here and it's going to spread to this many people by here if we don't do anything. At the same time, communication scholars had been using the same model to track the spread and the contagiousness of a rumor, of misinformation, of disinformation. So while I was making diagrams like this, they were making diagrams like this and like this which then also shows you the nodes. And this may not be false information. It might be a piece of factual information, but there are ways to spread it and ways to track it. And sometimes you're tracking actual outlets and websites and Twitter, perhaps. And other times you might be tracking transmission between people. So here we have a visual of SARS super spreaders during that outbreak in Beijing all those years ago, more than 20 years ago now. And we know that some people can be super spreaders, perhaps based on something to do with their immune system that makes them more contagious or something to do with their lifestyle. Perhaps they're very popular. They just hang out with a lot more people, for example. Again, there are parallels between the spread of an infection like SARS and the spread of a rumor, either in a school or in a county or across the world. So as I mentioned to you, we have this visual depiction of a flu outbreak in a high school here. And then we have this depiction of a rumor outbreak, rumor transmission. And then we have this other analogy between infection spread and rumor spread. We have super spreaders. It turns out we have super spreaders of misinformation and disinformation too. You may have heard of these folks during COVID. 
Much was written about them by the Center for Countering Digital Hate, NPR and the BBC and others also reported on the Center for Countering Digital Hate's research on this because what the CCDH found was that these 12 people were responsible for the transmission of 65% of the falsehoods we were seeing online about COVID. And this was mostly on Facebook and Instagram. And what the visual here shows is which platforms these folks were removed from and CCDH's point was, hey, social media platforms, namely Meta, we're giving you this data on who is spreading the falsehoods. Why are you not deplatforming them? So I've shown you some of the parallels between how an infection can spread and cause harm and then how misinformation or disinformation can spread and cause harm. And I want to give us another parallel that was is being used and was discovered to be protective against falling for lies. So we're now going to enter a section where we're thinking more about solutions. We've learned that there were parallels between how infection spreads and how a rumor spreads. And now we'll learn how those parallels can actually help us prevent transmission or at least prevent quote unquote infection with a lie, if you like. So I'm going to start here with a history lesson from the 1700s when there was a deadly virus spreading through Massachusetts. It was wiping out entire indigenous communities, thousands of colonizers and the people that they enslaved. The virus was called what well, we call it variola. There was no vaccine at the time. That variola virus causes smallpox. And if you got it, which you were very likely to do at the time, then infection meant a one in three chance of dying a painful, disfiguring death. So along comes this enslaved man who you're looking at, known only by the name Onesimus, and he said he had a solution. Now, he had been enslaved from Africa, and he was, quote unquote, given to a white man, Cotton Mather, in 1706 as a human, quote unquote, gift from that Puritan minister's Boston congregation. And at that time, because smallpox was killing so many people, Cotton Mather asked Onesimus, have you suffered this disease? And Onesimus said something like, yes and no, which was a, a really weird answer. So what he was saying was that there had been a time when a thorn had been dipped in the pus of a person who was sick with smallpox, and that thorn that was dipped in the pus of their lesion was scratched into Onesimus's arm. And this happened back in Africa, he said. He also explained that that exposure with that thorn caused him to have a mild version of the disease. And what his people believed was that that, was that, that would protect him or them from future bouts of severe or even deathly infection. And he went on to say, like, look, this is a really common practice where I come from. It's basically a technique that he understood had been repeated for a very long time before he was born. So Onesimus basically showed Cotton Mather the scar on his arm from the thorn, which was proof that he had received this life-saving treatment that came to be known as variolation. And, you know, you might think that Mather would have jumped at a chance to protect his family, the people of his congregation, the people of Massachusetts from smallpox. But he said that Onesimus was lying, that he was wicked and rebellious, and so he didn't do anything with that information. A few years later, there was yet another epidemic of smallpox ravaging Boston. And this time, Mather paid closer attention to Onesimus's scientific acumen. And by that point, he'd also heard of a similar technique used in Turkey. So in 1716, Mather wrote a letter to the Royal Society of London describing the method that Onesimus had told him about with the thorn and the pus and the lesion. And then five years later, in 1721, as yet another smallpox outbreak killed Bostonians, Mather wrote a letter to the city's doctors describing variolation. But because he had also said where he got the information from, an enslaved African man, most of the doctors didn't pay any attention. There was one guy, though, Dr. Zabdiel Boylston, who actually decided he would use Onesimus's variolation method on two people he had enslaved and his son. And 
This did not go down well. People were very angry. Someone threw a grenade into Mather's house for spreading this information. But actually, when Dr. Zabdiel Ballston used this on his son and other people, it worked and it kept people safe. So over the following months, the doctor used Onesimus' technique on 242 people in total, and only 2% of those people who'd received the treatment died from smallpox. If you hadn't received that treatment, then the death toll was seven times higher. So what does this have to do with protecting our brains from falling for misinformation and disinformation? Well, it's yet another parallel between the spread of infection and the spread of misinformation and disinformation that I'm going to share with you. So now fast forward from the 1700s to 1961, when this man, Dr. Bill Maguire, who's at Harvard at the time, wonders that if a disease can be prevented by giving a small and weakened dose of the offending pathogen, such as smallpox, to a person, then could we protect people from believing falsehoods by exposing them to a small and weakened dose of a lie? And he understood he wasn't a vaccinologist. Uh, Bill McGuire was a social psychologist, but he understood that vaccines worked by giving our immune systems a heads up, basically, about an incoming invader. And by offering the body a small or weakened piece of a virus or bacteria, the immune system can study the threat and get ready to fight off a future infection. One way that the immune system does this is by making antibodies. I'm sure you've heard like there's large sticky proteins that seek out invaders, latch onto them and do different things to defend the body against attack. Okay, so but why was Maguire worried about this or thinking about inoculating people against falling for falsehoods in 1961? Well, the US had been at war with North Korea in the hopes of quelling the rise of communism. And Maguire was worried that Korean forces had taken a page out of the Soviet Union's disinformation playbook and started to or were planning to brainwash Americans. And he was especially concerned about this incident that occurred where a number of American prisoners of war were released by North Korea and seemed to have no desire to come back to America. And Maguire wondered how that could be, um, what lies had they been fed, like it must be propaganda that had brainwashed them to become perhaps anti-American and pro-communism. And so he wondered, is there something you can do up front ahead of the threat to protect someone from persuasion? So he had this idea that he didn't call intellectual antibodies, but many in the field are calling it that now this idea that could small, weakened doses of a lie help to develop intellectual antibodies in a person that they could then protect a person from believing in a falsehood. So an example of this would be if you believe that genetically modified organisms or GMOs um, are safe to eat, and then someone comes along and tries to convince you that they're poisonous and bad for your health, and they're doing that based on false information, then Maguire would have hoped that his method of developing intellectual antibodies would help you to hold on to your original belief that GMOs are safe to eat and prevent you from being duped into thinking or believing that GMOs are toxic. So there's this idea that because you have this, these intellectual antibodies, you will be cognitively protected against falling for a falsehood. So if you want to call this a rumor vaccine, say, um, Maguire said it would work by doing two things. First, it issues a threat that serves as a warning that false information is headed your way. And then second, the rumor vaccine against false information makes you think upfront about responses to challenge the false information that you were about to hear. And Maguire's language for this and what social psychologists still refer to this as is counter arguments. So if you're like, one way that this could have worked really well, um, and very sadly wasn't used, is during the development of a vaccine for COVID. We saw this mass effort where more nations were coming together than ever before, united to develop COVID vaccines, and more money was being pulled together than ever before. So that although before COVID, the fastest we'd ever made a vaccine was about 10 years, and that was for months, just over 10 years. 
many of us could see if we were like trained in the field that it was so likely that we could develop not even just one, but multiple COVID vaccines in a, in a year, in a record num- amount of time. Because there'd been work done up front for a pandemic, there'd been work done up front for a coronavirus pandemic, even if it was something new there, and we were seeing the pooling of resources and person power that I mentioned, right? It was so obvious that if a vaccine or vaccines were developed, there was going to be rumor spread about them. It was like you could have put money on it. And then you could have made a lot of money by saying, I bet you, and then brainstorming 10 lies that would be told, um, one of which might be, oh, it's not going to be safe because it was developed too quickly. What would have been so helpful is while we were in the lab cooking up the vaccines, we should have been in another lab cooking up a way to use Maguire's inoculation theory, which is the name of this rumor vaccine idea. And what you could do then, for example, is say, hey, everyone, we now, it now looks like we're two months out, three months out from COVID vaccines. The randomized controlled trials are going really well. We can't guarantee, but it looks like by this date, we think we'll have vaccines. And then what you could have done is tell a population, and by the way, because we're doing this in record time, and because there's already a growing anti-vaccine movement, you might be about to hear in two or three months' time these six rumors about the vaccine. And if we had followed Bill Maguire's advice and done use inoculation theory, then it would have looked something like, hey, everyone, you're about to hear these rumors. Here's why they're not true. And let us give you some counter arguments that when you're hit over the head with them, you'll remember like, oh, they did say I should prepare to um, hear this kind of thing. And actually, if I remember from like two months ago, I'm pretty sure there were these counter arguments. And then they start coming to mind. Basically, someone rang the alarm bell ahead of you being hit with the false information and then that threat warning prompted you to develop responses to the incoming false information and so together you've got threat warning counter arguments and they strengthen your belief that actually what the scientists are saying is accurate and these covid vaccines are likely effective and safe basically inoculation theory makes you more resistant to persuasion And I'm not saying it hasn't been used. I think there were many missed opportunities to use it recently, especially in the context of public health. But it's been used over the decades. It's been used to help teens say no to cigarettes and say yes to safer sex. Um, I'll tell you a quick example that in the case of teen smoking, high school students were inoculated with a rumor vaccine, if you like. Um, They, high school students kind of were used to inoculate, in fact, junior high students against smoking. So first, the junior high students were told, hey, did you know peer pressure is really persuasive and makes a ton of people start smoking? And then after that warning came, there was a chance to role play a scenario where the junior high student got called a coward by an older student and was made fun of for not trying a cigarette. And the younger student could then hear what those threats might sound like. You're this, you're that, but not smoking. And they could practice how they would successfully react to the peer pressure. And the students who received this psychological vaccine in the form of the warning and the role plays and the developing counter arguments were 50, 50% less likely to become smokers compared to their peers who were not immunized against peer pressure to start smoking. We have also seen inoculation theory used in the case of teen pregnancy and the prevention of sexually transmitted infections and actually drug use. There are programs that use inoculation theory, which had success rates of 30 to 70 percent, meaning that up to seven out of 10 young people were less likely to engage in harmful behaviors such as unprotected sex or substance misuse once they had received that psychological vaccine. Um, Inoculation theory, I want to give you some examples of how we did see it being used in a really interesting way during COVID. Um, Again, I think it's really slept on and I think it's underused. But you may have heard of this, the bad news game. If you haven't played it before, I highly recommend you to check it out after our talk today and and tell people about it. Um, The researchers at Cambridge University who developed this game 
Basically, when you play it, they turn you into a bad actor, someone spreading disinformation. So what they're kind of doing in an, in an interesting way is instead of using inoculation theory to protect against like pandemic disinformation specifically, the psychologists at Cambridge created this computer game that uses inoculation theory to protect more broadly against the many different ways that people are duped. So if we know, for example, and there's so much research that shows using language that triggers strong emotions such as rage or disgust or anxiety, manufacturing conspiracy theorists and stuff like that, all of that is used to manipulate us. Then when you play the bad news game, it gives you, the player, the chance to use those deceitful tactics. So once you start playing this, for example, the aim of the game is to get people to believe a lie. You can do things like unleash Twitter bots. You can uh, manipulate photos to spread false information. You can pose as the editor of a credible news site. But basically, your goal is to spread disinformation far and wide. Your goal is to mislead as many people as possible, all within the safety of the game, of course. But at the same time, you can't just be super, super outlandish because you have to keep a close eye on what they call your credibility score. And if that score drops, it means people are less likely to believe the false information you're spreading and you're more likely to lose the game. And what they have done is studied how much resilience against false information this game confers. And in a study of, there's one study of 15,000 people where those who played the bad news game were much less likely to be swayed by false information in real life. And the those who played the game, because now they understood, oh, this is what people are doing behind the scenes. This is how Twitter bots work and you really get to embody it and have fun with it while you're learning. Then spreading disinformation in the game conferred mental immunity to them. And so it worked like a psychological vaccine against BS, basically. Um, so I'm sure you've heard of debunking, right, when you're taking apart a myth. Pre-bunking is often sometimes what's used to call inoculation theory because you're trying to get ahead of the person being duped. You're trying to say, hey, these tactics might be used against you or this lie might be told to you. Let's get in there. What they are doing with this particular rollout of inoculation theory, like I said, is really taking you behind the scenes to see what tactics work. And so what you've got there. Um, is more of a logic base than a content-based pre-bunking. What we mean by that is we can get really caught up in the content of the lie. It's about an election. It's about climate change. It's about gun control. But actually, if you take a bird's eye view, become a bit content agnostic and more focused on the logic, the strategy, the tactics used to manipulate us, then that can be very powerful. Here you can see that there's impersonation. It's a really fun game to play. I recommend it. So that's the primer on inoculation theory, where it came from, all the way from borrowing from vac vaccinology from, to social psychology to now being rolled out with the bad news game. But I also want to introduce you now to a more scientific approach to debunking. So if inoculation theory is pre-bunking, because you're hoping to get people before they've been hit over the head with loads of false information, debunking is where you're trying to take apart information that they've already absorbed. It's arguably harder. It really depends, though, on which end of the political spectrum people are at, their age, and all kinds of other societal factors. But I want to introduce you to this taxonomy, these five techniques of science denial, which were developed and built on by John Cook, a researcher at Monash University. And I highly recommend looking up John Cook's work. He has a great website. He's also developed a game that I'm going to tell you about in a second. And he has good videos and content online that goes deeper into this. He focuses a lot on how these techniques are used to spread climate change denialism in what the fact when I explain John Cook's work to a younger audience, um, I talk about how it can be used to debunk lies about so many things. So really quickly, how does it work? What John, and he's building on other research as well, they're saying that when they have unraveled 
the ways in which we are lied to, it often goes back to five key strategies that are used to dupe us and manipulate us. And they fleshed out even more so you can see all these different examples. But this is going back to this idea that logic-based debunking, where you're not getting bogged down in the actual content of the lie, in research seems to confer a broader umbrella of immunity against lies. So let me explain that with a scenario. Say you are at the Thanksgiving dinner table with a cranky uncle, um, and I, I use that phrase deliberately, you'll see why, but a cranky uncle who just will not believe that climate change is real. And you're just butting heads because you just want to debunk by saying that's not true, and I've got this data on CO2 levels and blah, blah, blah. You can get really heated. We've all been there or we've seen it. Uh, it gets very polarized. And what the communications research shows us is that pouring facts onto an already contentious, already polarized discussion is like pouring kerosene onto a fire. It's not as if that cranky uncle probably hasn't heard at least some of the data points that you're sharing, right? But they've chosen to not believe them. So why would hitting them over the head with facts work? And there's more and more research showing that our biases are quite deep seated and that by just trying to debunk and refute a piece of information with facts is jarring for everyone and not the best use of your time. So what John Cook and others are saying is let's learn these five key strategies and techniques that are used to lie to us. And then what you can do is in that conversation with the cranky uncle, maybe there is something, uh, some common ground that you can find. Um, okay, so for some reason, we don't know why, but they um, don't believe in climate change. However, find the common ground of something that you do agree on. Maybe that thing is the COVID vaccine. They just have good faith in the COVID vaccine and they got vaccinated and you can find that common ground and therefore take the heat out of the conversation about um, climate change. And you can say, hold on, hold on. Let's go to, instead of getting stuck in the weeds of why climate change actually is real and why you're so wrong, which is just going to antagonize someone, if you talk to them like that, you can ask them, how is it that you came to believe that? And so you get curious, you have empathy, you genuinely are trying to figure out where on earth did you read what you read that made you think that climate change is a hoax. Once they start giving you that information, um, you will probably find that they were misled using one or two or all five of these techniques. Um, and, and I'll go through these in a second. And then what you can do is go back to the common ground that you have. We affirm that you both agree that COVID vaccines are safe. And then you can say, hey, you know how there are those people that don't believe in the COVID vaccines being safe? And one of the ways they are lied to is Fake experts are rolled out who appear to be doctors or who appear to be credible doctors, and they look like they have the right credentials to speak about a vaccine, but then they say all these things about how vaccines cause autism, and that's actually not true. And then your uncle will be like, yeah, it's so ridiculous how some people think the COVID vaccine isn't safe. And yeah, one of the ways they are duped is fake experts. And then you can bring it around to, well, actually, that same technique is sometimes used against people to so that they don't believe that climate change is a very real threat that it is. There are people who are coming out and they appear to be climate scientists or geologists or something, and they really are not. So to go through these strategies, you have fake experts, and then they've really fleshed out the taxonomy, and you can share as little or as much of this depending on which audience or age group you're working with, but you can have bulk fake experts. You can have a magnified minority where it looks like um, there's such debate in the medical field where in fact there might actually be near consensus but it's made to look as if this vaccine or this topic is very contentious and that can be very confusing for people you then in the flick taxonomy have the l for logical fallacies which is a whole bunch basically everything on here actually is a logical fallacy of some kind a straw man argument false equivalent apples oranges but the l is kept there by john cook and others because it's helpful to remember it as its own tactic that's used to lie to us then you have impossible expectations. Um, 
So basically, as we know in science, nothing's 100%. But what happens is that's used against you to say, well, if you can't be 100% accurate or 100% sure, then I'm going to go with such and such. And that's really used against us because often the um, snake oil salesman will say, buy my silver oxide mouthwash goggle for $29.99. It's 100% effective against COVID. And often that 100% is actually a, a flag because scientists and incredible scientists won't use that language. Next on the taxonomy, we have two Cs. We have cherry picking, where basically people are just picking out the data that already supports their worldview, and they are refuting um, and choosing not to look at the data that does not um, support their worldview. And then, of course, we have conspiracy theories. And so with this logic-based approach, where you can move away from the content, move away from the heated discussion, become content agnostic, and talk about the logic debunking, the logic-based debunking, the, the tactics that are used to dupe us, what John Cook and his team have done is also gamify this in the same way that those at Cambridge um, have gamified inoculation theory and pre-bunking, John Cook's team have created the Cranky Uncle ga game or app, which you can find. And it's, again, a really useful illustration in how these tactics are really put into action. Uh, and there are some fun uh, images of the cranky uncle that show um, what these arguments can feel like. Like, how is it global warming if it's been colder here than it's been in years? And you can kind of just get stuck in that argument and just kind of butting heads. And what the game does really well is go through how or teach you basically how to use the strategies to protect yourself, to confer an umbrella of protection to your brain against falling for falsehoods. And then also, I think overall, these make us better people by making us better equipped at disagreeing and pre-bunking and debunking with those around us. So here's another image from the Cranky Uncle app or game where someone's falling and it's like the whole impossible expectations. Hey, you're going to hit the ground in 12 to 15 seconds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get back to me when you have more certainty. We don't like that range. Um, so those are some of the solutions based, uh, sorry, evidence-based solutions that we have. And I, I feel like we've been winging it for too long, that for as long as there's been humans and as long as we will hopefully continue to exist if there's not a mass extinction caused by us, there are going to be people that spread false information and because it, they will do it well and because there's a playbook and because there are these time-tested strategies that have been used from big tobacco to now and probably before then as well, definitely before then as well, there are going to be among us those who fall for this. And sometimes that's us. You know, the data shows that the higher your educational attainment level, actually, the more deep-seated your biases are. It can be harder to convince you that you're wrong than that is not protective. What we are really aiming for here is this balance of a healthy mental immune system where you can let in good ideas or you can let in ideas enough to assess them. You're not that person who walks around thinking they're clever just because they're skeptical and they won't let anything in. But at the same time, you have those critical thinking skills that allow you to pass the information. Is this fact? Is this fiction? How do I know? How do I assess a source? And so I think this really is the answer that if we're not, we have to be advocating to government at various levels to incorporate media literacy and digital lit literacy and critical thinking into curricula, teach those flick methods, understand how inoculation theory works, um, there are many fighting that uphill fight, many of you doing it in classrooms and in different spaces and many doing it at the legislative level. But it really was my wholehearted motivation behind writing this book was that if we're not able to get this information to all kids everywhere because it's a partisan issue or it's a funding issue or who knows what the agenda is in different places, then at least can we give them a book that teaches this in a really in fun and informative way, it feels like being told a story. It's not like reading a textbook. Um, because I think that's our only hope at not having another insurrection or not having every future epidemic, because of course there'll be so many more, but not having each epidemic or pandemic also be overrun with misinformation and disinformation. 
For those of you who are interested in teaching the book, there, are, there is a free teaching guide online on my website, simayasmin.com, or on the Pulitzer Center website. And it has chapter summaries and guides and lesson plans in there that kind of bring all the different sections of the book to life. Again, with this hope that if we can get this information to people early on, to kids early on, then they'll grow up to be savvy consumers of information, uh, you know, healthy participants in a democracy, and that they'll also just protect their own sanity by, by being critical readers and knowing how to assess information. I have heard from many adults, too, that they found it helpful because there, there's a literal script in here in what the facts on how to have a productive disagreement with somebody. So it doesn't feel like you're just butting heads and hitting each other over the head with facts but actually moving towards a productive disagreement where you might hold some chance of changing someone's mind. And adults have said they found that useful when they've had arguments with family members about COVID or about gun control or all kinds of things. So I hope you'll find the book useful and the teaching guide useful too. Thank you so much for your attention. And I'd be very happy to take your questions now. Awesome. Thank you so much. That was phenomenal. <laughs> um, and I am looking through the chat and it's clear that the teachers, uh, all the educators who are here tonight, uh, you're enjoying yourselves. And uh, thank you for those who uh, included your questions in the chat. We have a few more minutes remaining. So if there are any additional questions, please enter them in the chat. I will go ahead and dig right in. Uh, this question is from Jeanette. Uh, her question is, is, we're often being compared to places like Finland and Sweden, Sweden, et cetera. But how homogeneous are these countries? It's, it seems difficult to compare the two settings. Do you think our diversity and population size hinders us? How do we embrace our diversity while dealing with its complexity? Great question. And I will say, I, I know I rolled out that example of Finland, and I do think it's worth studying. But I honestly am that person that will roll her eyes a bit when people talk about like the Scandi countries being the most, the happiest, because I think, yeah, there, there are differences everywhere. And is it is it not actually borrowing from the slick taxonomy, comparing apples to oranges? I do think there are massive differences. I think there are historical differences that actually have to be taken into account too. But on the same hand, like I said, I think there's so much to be learned from a nation, yes, a much smaller, much less populated nation, rolling out a program on teaching critical thinking and media literacy. I wonder then, to your great question, is it an example that states can use? Because maybe there are states that are a similar size or a similar population, but again, kind of taking it on that level of <clears throat> America, especially now, can feel so polarized. Um, can, this, this, the social cohesion doesn't feel like it's there. Maybe we need a more targeted approach from even county to county, perhaps. And that, that's kind of the hope with writing a book, I think, even though it's one resource and one physical thing, I do think it lends itself to kind of being, when you read a book, you take different things from it, from person to person. And so as an educator, someone who's teaching it, looking at the book and looking at the teaching guide, which I dropped the link in the chat and I'll just do it again in case it got lost in there. But I think there are ways to tailor it for the audiences or the age groups or the people that we're working with. So in a nutshell, lots to learn from Finland. Can it just be easily exactly replicated here? Probably not at all. But yet, I think there will be nuggets there that we could perhaps use on a smaller scale. Thank you for that question. Perfect. Uh, yes, and definitely. Thank you, Jeanette. The next question we have is from Paige. Her question is, uh, I've read findings from other scientists that study spread of disinformation, et cetera, that one should avoid repeating the myth or the wrong information when also giving the correct information because exposure to the myth or wrong information is so powerful and people come away with a stronger belief in the myth from having heard it again, even in a setting where it's being debunked. How does this fit in with the idea of a rumor vaccine? Yes, thank you for that question. That research certainly does exist, and it can make us really fearful that, oh my gosh, just repeating the myth, even in service of trying to debunk it or maybe pre-bunk it, I'm just, am I just giving it more oxygen and a platform and it's going to spread more? 
it really, there is an art and a science to debunking, which is why I kind of slipped that in earlier in that, yes, I love the evidence base and please let's be evidence based about move, how we move forward with these solutions. But there's an art to it too. And I think that art is empathy. I think that art is reading the room. I think that art is knowing who we're talking to and therefore how safe or effective is it in repeating that myth. I think sometimes, honestly, it's just quite necessary or often you're just being presented with that myth anyway. I think understanding the science of inoculation theory and pre-bunking reassures me more than anything that actually done the right way, not even repeating the myth, but introducing the myth to someone's ears by, hey, you're going to hear this in six months or three months or next week. Actually, if you do it the right way by saying, and actually, I, here's why I'm telling you that you're going to hear it. And here are three counter arguments that reassure you why that's not true. That's going to be much more effective. So Yes, the research exists kind of saying different tactics work with different people. I think what that teaches us it's, is let's use evidence-based strategies, but let's be targeted in who we're talking with. And actually, there's another talk I give about like the disinformation playbook. And one of the things that those folks do really well is research who they are talking to. It's never a one-size-fits-all strategy to dupe all of us. It's very community-specific. So I think that's a tactic we should steal back from them. <laughs> indeed, indeed. I will repeat one of the uh, posts that Shanga is included in the chat. The art is empathy. That needs to be a T-shirt. So very, very good, Shanga. Um, we have a few teachers who are here. Um, actually, I shouldn't say a few. We have several teachers who are here who teach at the primary or elementary school level. And there are a few questions about resources that you may recommend, um, maybe um, uh, you know, uh, open access, public domain, or any other resources that you would recommend for teachers who are tackling this subject, uh, particularly uh, for those who are at maybe the elementary or primary level. Uh, any resources that you can point them in the direction? My yeah. first comment is to say thank you for teaching it. <laughs> There's um, so much out there that at least reaffirms that you can teach this stuff early on, taught the right way. And by people like yourself, kids are able to have actually pretty complicated conversations about critical thinking. I haven't had discussions about this stuff with primary age children, but I'll tell you, and I was doing the book tour for What the Fact in 2022 and last year and still doing some events now, I have been going to middle schools and I've had some of the best conversations with like 11 year old girls about the politics of COVID and why we were told certain things and why scientists changed their minds. Um, I haven't got a very neat answer about finding resources, I'm afraid. Perhaps if I think of more after this, I can email Mike and that can be sent out or I can add to my website. But I do think at least at the middle school level, you'll be able to use my teaching guide and just adapt that for the particular class group. One thing I found helpful when I was working with kids, at least on the younger end for me, was soliciting from them what they were hearing and what they were worried about. And often when I got these really funny confessions from someone in the classroom, they'd be like, oh, I love spreading rumors. <laughs> and people would say, yeah, he does, he does. And then we'd have a whole conversation about why that was, why stories are compelling, and I'd get to translate things about uh, this, that social psychologists teach us about like humans get a um, like a certain level of status points from being the first person to share a piece of information, whether it's true or not. So I think tailoring it that way can be helpful. But I hope my my teaching guide and the book overall can still be a resource for you. Absolutely, absolutely. And um, again, everyone, thank you so much for sharing your evening uh, with us. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Yasmin, for, for being here. Uh, I know your schedule is incredibly packed and busy, um, and we just uh, are, are truly grateful for you. Um, to all our teachers who are here in the room, um, you can follow Dr. Yasmin online, um, and you have the links to her website. And uh, also, I will encourage you all to check out the book, What the Fact, as well as the uh, companion guides that go along with that. We encourage you to please check those out. And um, again, Dr. Yasmin has uh, uh, entered the links in the chat. And we are all appreciative of everything that you all are doing. 
To keep up with all that's happening at the National Humanities Center, we encourage you to follow us um, at National Humanities or at NHC Education. And of course, our main landing page, which is located at nationalhumanitycenter.org. Support the humanities uh, education programs. The NHC Education programs provide a bridge between the academic world and the working classroom. Your gift, no matter how modest, can open up a world of ideas for teachers and rekindle their enthusiasm for the subjects they teach by providing the knowledge and the tools uh, that they and their students need to make a difference. We will be back April 23rd, 7 o'clock p.m. with Armenian Genocide, Armenian Identity and Life in the United States with Dr. Bedros Der Matosian, uh, who joins us from the University of Nebraska at Lincoln. Um, if you have not already registered, uh, we encourage you to do so. We have two more webinars remaining. And so, uh, again, thank you for your support throughout the year. And again, we are uh, truly appreciative of our speaker, our leader for this session tonight. Um, it has truly been a joy and an honor to be here with you tonight. And uh, we wish you all the best, and we will continue to follow all the things that you are doing. To our teachers who are here, again, thank you. And we hope the remainder of your uh, week goes exceptionally well. Uh, if you want to remain a little while longer, there are a few links that are in the chat, particularly to the GetBadNews.com website. Um, some of you all asked about the, uh, the guides and you can find uh, information there. Uh, the crankyuncle.com um, site link is also um, in there as well. So um, please uh, hang tight and go ahead and grab those links so that you can include them uh, in your classroom instruction. Thank you so much. Take care and be well. <laughs>